Biederman, 212 Choices. Cherish your life. Custom prostate cancer treatment with Dr. Lederman, 212 Choices. Welcome back to the Radio Surgery Hour. This is Rob Redstone here with Dr. Gil Lederman at the WOR Studios in the heart of New York City. We're just a few steps from the Radio Surgery New York Cancer Treatment Center on Broadway and 38th Street. Dr. Lederman, the leading cancer expert, treats prostate cancer non-invasively. He was the first in New York with fractionated brain radio surgery, and he's the first in America and in the Western Hemisphere with body radio surgery. You can also call Dr. Lederman at 212 Choices for a free informative booklet and DVD. Hey, Dr. Lederman, we're back. Hey, we're back. It's Dr. Lederman on the Radio Surgery Hour. Happy to take your calls. We're at 1-800-321-0710. <clears throat> There's a new paper out that looks at what is the benefit of having mammography versus self-examination in women 75 and older. There's a new study that shows that women who are 75 years and older, more likely when they have mammograms, have an earlier cancer an earlier cancer than cancers that are detected by the woman or detected by her physician. The five-year success rate for mammographically detected cancers in this study it was published in Radiology by Melgren from uh, Seattle. The five-year cancer-free survival was 97%. Now, some say if you're 75 or older, what the heck, why should you get it? Well, the fact is, This 97% success rate compared to an 87% success rate when either the patient or the physician found the cancer. There was less surgery. There was better success, better results overall. So it's another reason that women of America may wish to get mammography to find cancers earlier, have to improve prognosis. I know there's a lot of brouhaha over the role of mammography, You may want to look at the data and talk to your physician or give us a call uh, during the work week or if you have medical questions, call us at 212-CHOICES, 212-246-4237. We had a patient, a gentleman, 91 years old with an elevated PSA. Yes, what should he do? He's in excellent health. He's fully functional, no limitations, no illness. What should he do? Well, there's a nice article that was in the Harvard University Gazette, and the title was, The longer you live, the longer you can expect to live. And in fact, this article goes through the odds of how long someone's going to live. And this man who's 91 is more likely going to hit 100 than most of us. And if he has a cancer, it's his choice to either pursue it or not, to talk to his physicians or not. But he shouldn't be written off just because of a particular age, whether someone is 60, 70, 80, 90, Hundred, whatever it is, talk to your physicians or give us a call about what might be the best treatment options and the best screening options for you. Another gentleman came from a famous cancer center. He's a uh, 70-year-old man with kidney cancer. Now, in that cancer hospital, they removed one kidney for cancer. Then they removed half of the other kidney for cancer. So he's functioning on just a half of one kidney. And, in fact, that's all any one of us needs is a half of one kidney. That's why you can donate your kidney to your brother or your sister or your friend and be okay. But they, at this big famous cancer center, said, well, they they think he has a cancer in the remaining half of kidney, and they want to remove the remaining half. And he came to us asking, what should he do? Should he lose his kidney and go on dialysis? He says he doesn't want to lose his kidney. He doesn't want to go on dialysis, even if it's only half a kidney. It's working for him. Well, we worked him up, and we found out that contrary to what he was told at the big cancer hospital, he didn't have a cancer in that kidney. He only had a cyst. And they were going to remove that half of kidney, the last piece of kidney, for a cyst? And what we found is actually he had metastasis to the liver. So we found cancer in the liver. They didn't find. We found cysts in the kidney. So he's keeping his kidney. He's having radio surgery, non-invasive treatment to the liver. He actually just finished his treatment. He's feeling great, no side effects, fully functional. And he'll be back for staging. And we'll talk to you about him as time goes on, most likely to give, based upon our data, about a 90% chance that he'll be in remission when we talk next. We have a call now from David on the line uh, from Manhattan. Good evening, David. Hi, how are you tonight? 
Thank you. Thank you for calling. What do you mean, first in America to do radio surgery? How did that happen? First in America to do radio surgery, and how did it happen? A great question. <clears throat> when we started radio surgery, there was no radio surgery. So big hospitals, little hospitals, nobody did radio surgery. We were the first ones to do stereotactic body radio surgery. So what does it mean? First of all, it means if you imagine a plum in a bread box. Up to that time, if you had a cancer that was like a plum and it was in your lung like the bread box, most of your lung would be radiated at the same dose and the same time as the cancer. So doctors weren't very good at focusing. In fact, they couldn't focus the beam on the cancer. So they focused it around the cancer. And all that radiation to the healthy tissue caused harm. So we were eager to bring this program to America for a variety of reasons, one of which is we were the first in New York to do brain radio surgery. And many people thought it was a charade, we were charlatans, that it's not possible. But over the test of time, the next 25 years, has proven our vision. And the fact is we now have the longest experience in New York with brain radio surgery, the longest experience in New York, in America and the Western Hemisphere with stereotactic body radio surgery. What does it mean? Well, it means that we had the vision to do something that no one else in America had, number one. Number two, we were willing to do things because we believed that they were right. And many people, unfortunately, said it was a gimmick. <clears throat> well, surgeons obviously didn't want to lose patients. They thought, well, if you we can do radio surgery on a lung cancer or a kidney cancer or a liver cancer, those patients will no longer need surgery. And they were right. Many of those patients no longer need surgery. And chemo doctors thought, well, if we could have a 90% success rate for treating primary or metastatic cancers, that patients wouldn't come for them either. And the radiation doctors, who obviously no one did it except us, said, what is he doing? We're going to lose patients to Dr. Lederman. So there was a bit of... Um, confidence or boldness. We didn't come from nowhere. We went to Sweden. We studied with the man who developed radio surgery in Sweden. We spent a lot of time and worked with him in Sweden and worked with him in New York. So we had a lot of experience, a lot of technology, and a lot of background. Having a background in medicine, medical oncology, and radiation also gave us a lot of experience that most centers do not have. They didn't have it then. They don't have it now. So we had a greater depth of expertise in the field, greater depth of expertise in oncology, and a very long track record. So what does it mean to us? It means that we have experience and a background in training and practice that no one else has. And that's what you mean by triple board certified? Triple board certified, after medical school, there's a training process. So the training process Often a doctor will spend a certain number of years in a specialty, and most doctors are trained in one specialty. Some are trained in two. I'm trained, luckily, in three, and I did that because when I was in Boston at Harvard, I saw that many chemo doctors really didn't know what radiation was about, and many radiation doctors really didn't know what chemo was about. And by so bridging all three specialties gives our patients a benefit that most patients in most cancer hospitals just don't have with their own doctor. And one last question. Radio surgery, there's no surgery though, is that correct? Radio surgery is a misnomer, so it's misnamed. It was misnamed by a neurosurgeon in Sweden in the 1950s. He was thinking that if he could send a beam in to hit a tumor in the brain or hit an abnormal blood vessel in the brain, the beam would function much like his knife would function. So he was trying to convey the fact that our beam would destroy a cancer or a tumor or a blood vessel in the brain without cutting. So some people say they hear radio surgery and they think we're cutting. No, with us there's no cutting, no bleeding, no surgery. People walk in, get a 15-minute treatment, get up and go to Macy's or go to Times Square or go to work or go home. They go and do what they want to do. And most people have no significant side effects from the treatment. Fine. Thank, thank you a lot for the, answering the questions, and I'll, and I'll keep listening. Thank you very much, and God bless you. Thank you.
If you have any other questions, please call us at 1-800-321-0710. Noah and Ed are taking your calls, and they are fantastic. Uh, Follow-up in the good news department. We have a patient who came in this week. She had kidney cancer in 2002, much like the man I just talked about. But she had a kidney cancer in 2002. Rather than having one and a half kidneys removed like he did, she came to us. She investigated all the options. She chose to go with radio surgery. It's now 12 years later. She's had follow-up every six months, every six months for these 12 years, and she's in complete remission. She has both kidneys, and they're both fully functional. And she has no cancer anywhere else, and she's had no other treatment anywhere else. And I can tell you that she's very happy, very satisfied about radio surgery for her kidney cancer, which was successfully treated 12 years ago. We have another patient, a new patient who came to us from Brazil, a 50-year-old woman who's very fair complected, and you probably know where I'm going with fair complexion and cancer. She has a squamous cancer of the eyelid, a cancer of the left lower eyelid near the tear duct. She was diagnosed elsewhere. She had Mohs surgery. Mohs surgery is like a slicing, like slicing a salami, slice, 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 slice. And you try to cut off all the cancer without hurting the patient. Well, the problem is you keep on cutting, 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 cutting. She has right now a deformity of the left medial lower eyelid and tear duct. She had surgery six months ago, and the cancer is back. So one of her friends, actually it's a gentleman that we treated for prostate cancer successfully, and he's very happy about treatment and how we cared for him brought her here from Brazil. She's a missionary in the United States temporarily to investigate other methods of treatment. Elsewhere, she was told she may lose her eye. She may lose her eye from the skin cancer. So skin cancers can be very deforming around the eye, the nose, the ear, the mouth. If you have surgery with radiation, we don't cut. We don't remove the tissues. So she, at this point, wants us to proceed with focused treatment, to keep the eyelid that she has, to try to save her eye, save her vision, save her appearance, and hopefully save what she has, which is pretty good right now. So we'll report back to you, but this is just to let you know that we do treat many skin cancers, squamous cell and basal cells, Merkel cells, and melanoma, most anywhere in the body. And melanoma are very commonly treated where they spread, where they get in the bloodstream, and spread most anywhere with a high degree of success. I just want to talk about one other man before we have a station identification. A man came from upstate New York. He's been doing watchful waiting, and he's watched his Gleason score. He reported to me that his Gleason score has gone from 4 to 6 to 8. He's still doing watchful waiting. He's about 60 years old. Well, there's actually a data. There's data for analysis of men who are treated, who are screened and treated, There's a 13-year follow-up of a randomized study of men who are treated when they're diagnosed with prostate cancer after being screened or men who are not screened. And actually, there's a 27% reduction in death from prostate cancer in men who are screened. So some men choose to have watchful waiting, which means they're just waiting for the cancer to do something. Actually, multiple studies have shown that You don't save money by watchful waiting because those men are getting tests, they're getting biopsies, they're getting doctor's visits. They're not getting treatment. And for him, he's gone from a super favorable risk to a Gleason 8, which in surgical hands, and you can look at our booklet. In our booklet is data, and I'm just turning right now to page 11, figure 17. You can see that with surgery for Gleason 8, the best results in the best hand. This is data from two famous hospitals, one in Boston, one in Philadelphia, is just about 30%. Our results are more than double, about 125% better for Gleason 8, 9, 10 prostate cancer. This is our results and surgical results. And furthermore, the quality of life after surgery, and that's on page... 14 of our booklet, and we're happy to mail you the booklet at no charge. Men who go through open or robotic surgery have about a 97% sexual problem rate, 
Usually that means erections or lack of erections, inadequate.